The Federal Bureau of Investigation has been considered the world's premier law enforcement agency for a century since its founding. It has grown into many different areas since its inception. The first director of the FBI was also its longest serving, spanning almost five decades under eight presidents, and he was instrumental in creating an effective, all-encompassing, yet sometimes controversial organization. The FBI has since lost much of its luster, mired in corruption since the Obama administration and now the Biden administration, polluted with partisan political acolytes working under an equally corrupt Department of Justice. How did the FBI start out? Why was it created? Who was the real J. Edgar Hoover? How did he remain in charge for so long? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, military veteran, historian, author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. John Edgar Hoover was born on January 1, 1895 in Washington, D.C., without a birth certificate being filed, although it was required in 1895. Two of his siblings did have certificates, but Hoover's was only filed in 1938. Hoover attended Central High School and had, after graduating, landed a job in the Library of Congress where he learned proper organization and indexing of books, which would serve him well later. He graduated from George Washington University Law School with a bachelor's degree in law in 1916 and a year later earned an LLM in 1917 when he was hired by the Justice Department to work for the War Emergency Division on July 27, 1917, which paid him $990 a year, which would equate into $23,500 in 2024 dollars, which exempted him from the draft. Hoover began his questionable career when he became the head of the Alien Enemy Bureau, which was authorized by President Woodrow Wilson as the USA entered World War I. Hoover had the authority to investigate, question, arrest, and incarcerate any allegedly disloyal forwarders without trial. See our video on Woodrow Wilson. Hoover then received additional authority from the 1917 Espionage Act, where the Bureau arrested 98 suspicious Germans living in the U.S. without due process and also listed another 1,172 as worthy of arrest out of a total of 1,400. In 1919, Hoover took over the General Intelligence Division, which was known as the Radical Division, as they sought out communist and domestic threats and Hoover started his threat list of those he deemed to be subversive. In 1920, Hoover became a Freemason at D.C.'s Federal Lodge No. 1 in Washington, D.C., and then joined the Scottish Rite, becoming a 33rd degree Mason and Inspector General Honorary in 1955. President Calvin Coolidge appointed Hoover as the fifth director of the newly created Bureau of Investigation in 1924, and he immediately fired all female employees and forbid hiring women in the future. Hoover later restructured the organization, created later, and he renamed it the FBI, which we know today in June 1935. Hoover recruited intelligent and well-educated men to be agents as he expanded the FBI into a world-class crime-fighting agency. Unlike most organizations, Hoover accepted and sought out new technology, introducing many innovative methods such as the centralized fingerprint data file, the mugshot collection of known criminals, and introduced the new forensic science and specialized laboratories. Hoover also created the National Blacklist, also known as the FBI Index, and he created the 10 Most Wanted list for nationally known criminals. Hoover was also a jealous egomaniac who fired agents regularly or reassigned them to end their careers. The highest profile target of his erratic and unprofessional approach was when he forced Agent Melvin Purvis out of the FBI. Purvis, ironically, was the most successful agent 
in FBI history at busting up crime rings and arresting major criminals such as the Mafia and bootleggers, and his fame rose, outshining Hoover. Much of the success attributed to Purvis and his team were the captures or killing of major bank robbers, such as Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow, and other household names of the day, including Pretty Boy Floyd, Alvin Karpis, Babyface Nelson, and Machine Gun Kelly. Ironically, Hoover always denied the existence of organized crime, preferring to focus upon communists, despite the fratricidal wars being fought by the Mafia families during Prohibition. It was widely believed that gangsters Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello were in possession of embarrassing photographs of Hoover in women's clothes and in compromising intimate situations with his young protege, future FBI Deputy Director Clyde Tolson. I had the privilege of knowing and working with a woman named Kathy Lockhart. His brother was the bodyguard and driver for Meyer Lansky, and she told me this firsthand, that it was well known that Meyer Lansky had photographs of these two men in very intimate circumstances. During the 1940s, it was rumored that Hoover, who was seen by some of his agents in women's clothing and lived with his mother into his early 40s, was homosexual. Historians John Stuart Cox and Ethan G. Thea Harris speculated that Clyde Tolson, who became an assistant director to Hoover in his mid-40s and became his primary heir, had a sexual relationship with Hoover until the latter's death. It was also believed that Costello controlled Hoover, who was addicted to gambling by providing him horse racing tips, with their mutual friend, gossip columnist Walter Winchell being the courier. Hoover was well known to send his special agents to place $100 bets for him at the racetracks. Gambling and homosexuality would have been strong blackmail material. Author Anthony Summers, the author of Official and Confidential, The Secret Life of J. Edgar Hoover, quoted Louis Rosenthal's fourth wife, Susan, as claiming to have seen Hoover engaging in cross-dressing in the 1950s at all-male parties at the Plaza Hotel with her husband, Louis Rosenstiel, attorney Roy Cohn, and young male prostitutes. Another Hoover biographer, Burton Hirsch, later corroborated the story. In the FBI, it was apparently an open secret. Clint Murchison Sr., a loyal LBJ supporter and owner of the Del Charo Hotel in La Jolla, California, often threw parties of a questionable kind Hoover and Tolson also frequented the Del Charo Hotel. Summers quoted a source named Charles Krebs as saying, on three occasions that I knew about, maybe four boys were driven down to La Jolla at Hoover's request. Summers stated that Hoover often frequented New York City Stork Club. Louisa Stewart, a model who was 18 or 19 at the time, told Summers that she had seen Hoover holding hands with Tolson as they all rode in a limo uptown to the Cotton Club in 1936. Summers also claimed that Hoover was friends with Billy Breyers Jr., an alleged child pornographer, pedophile, and producer of the film, The Genesis Children, which was also blackmail material to keep Hoover in check. It may be more true that Hoover was in fact bisexual as he had relationships with actress Dorothy L'Amour in the late 1930s and early 1940s, and Delayla Rogers, the mother of actress Ginger Rogers. However, there is a contrary viewpoint, such as biographer Kenneth Ackerman, who says that Summer's accusations have been widely debunked by historians, but he can't provide sources to counter the allegations, whereas eyewitnesses support the previous theory. Journalist Liz Smith wrote that Cohn himself told her about Hoover's rumored transvestism long before it became common gossip. One source who is often overlooked is actress and singer Ethel Merman, who was a longtime friend of Hoover's since 1938, and she was very familiar with all the parties during his alleged romance of Layla Rogers. In a 1978 interview, and in response to Anita Bryant's anti-gay campaign at the time, she said, 
Some of my best friends are homosexual. Everybody knew about J. Edgar Hoover, but he was the best chief the FBI ever had. Hoover's private life notwithstanding, he was a dedicated anti-communist. Even before the USA entered World War II, Hoover was still focused on communists, but due to the threat of German espionage and later sabotage at East Coast ports, the FBI created a special department to handle those threats. During World War II, many things happened, such as the Quirin Affair, as German U-boats landed small groups of saboteurs in Florida and on Long Island to cause acts of sabotage. Both teams were apprehended after one of the anti-Nazi German agents contacted the FBI and told them everything. However, Hoover had to make it look like he and the FBI solved the case without any assistance, and the German who became an informant was also charged and convicted of espionage without any recognition. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, by the way, see our videos on him, was also fearful of foreign espionage and gave Hoover the authority to bug and wiretap at will without the necessary warrants. The U.S. Attorney General at the time, Robert H. Jackson, let Hoover decide on how and when to use wiretaps but he found the whole business quite distasteful, not to mention illegal and a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Hoover would continue using illegal methods for the next three decades. Hoover was also responsible for working with local law enforcement on arresting the mafia bosses who became too high profile. The greatest of these was Lucky Luciano. See our video on him. As the war dragged on, Luciano was approached by naval intelligence with FBI support to recruit Sicilian and Italian henchmen to join the Office of Strategic Services to work as pathfinders in Sicily and Italy prior to those invasions. Despite the Soviets being an ally during the war, Hoover actively spied on suspected communists in the U.S., working also with MI5 in the United Kingdom. Even before the war, he worked on the Verona Project. Hoover knew that he had a gold mine, and he kept the decoded wiretaps and listening device intercepts as well as information from code breaking, which were the greatest counterintelligence secrets in a locked safe in his office. He decided not to inform President Harry S. Truman, Attorney General J. Howard McGrath, or the Secretaries of State Dean Acheson and General George Marshall when they were in office. He did, however, inform the Central Intelligence Agency of the Verona Project and all the tapes and broken codes in 1952. Truman and Hoover did not get along. After Truman denied the FBI the privilege of becoming a global intelligence service, Truman wanted the FBI to focus upon domestic intelligence and crime and not conflict with the CIA. Harry Truman said that Hoover transformed the FBI into his private secret police force, stating, we want no Gestapo or secret police. The FBI is tending in that direction. They are dabbling in sex life scandals and plain blackmail. J. Edgar Hoover would give his right eye to take over, and all congressmen and senators are afraid of him. One point of contention was in 1946 when Attorney General Tom C. Clark authorized Hoover to compile a list of potentially disloyal Americans who might be detained during a wartime national emergency. In June 1950, as the Korean War started, Hoover submitted a plan to President Truman to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, much like Lincoln during the Civil War, and detain 12,000 Americans suspected of disloyalty. Truman, who was never a fan of FDR's internment of American citizens, based upon race, was not very receptive to the concept. However, despite his many years of denial, after the famed Appalachian meeting of the Bosses in 1957, which was recorded by the FBI, Hoover was finally forced to admit that there was in fact a national crime syndicate. Due to public knowledge and outcry, Hoover created the Top Hoodlum program and began going after the top crime bosses, but selectively. Hoover was also not very fond of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision that people could not be investigated due to their political affiliations. So, thwarted by the SCOTUS, Hoover, ever one to let the U.S. Constitution and federal law get in the way, created COINTELPRO, an acronym for Counterintelligence Program. 
At first, COINTELPRO targeted the Communist Party and Hoover ordered the observation, surveillance, wiretaps of any American he suspected of Communist sympathies. This included many celebrities, such as actors Sterling Hayden, Gene Seabrook, and Charlie Chaplin. Hoover's new methods included infiltration, burglaries, setting up illegal wiretaps, planting forged documents, and spreading false rumors about key members of target organizations. There was also credible evidence that Hoover authorized the inciting of violence and arranging murders. Hoover was detested by civil rights leader T.R.M. Howard of Mount Bayou, Mississippi, and the feeling was mutual. Howard had criticized the FBI's failure to investigate thoroughly the racially motivated murders of George W. Lee, Lamar Smith, and Emmett Till, alluding to Hoover being a Klan supporter. Hoover wrote an open letter to the press singling out these statements as irresponsible. In 1963, Hoover ordered a halt to the federal investigation into the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing by the Ku Klux Klan that killed four black girls. By May 1965, local investigators and the FBI had identified four suspects in the bombing, supported by witnesses, and this information was relayed to Hoover. However, ironically, no prosecutions were pursued, even though the evidence was reportedly, quote, so strong that even a white Alabama jury would convict. And also, in a strange turn of events, Hoover told his investigators not to share their findings regarding the bombing with local law enforcement, and he sealed the files. He tended to pick and choose the cases he wanted his agents working on depending upon political expediency. Hoover used his own Gestapo methods against many people, including both John F. and Robert F. Kennedy two men he loathed, mainly because they would not allow him unfettered authority. It became known that Hoover had illegally bugged Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., actually bugging the hotel rooms where King would entertain white prostitutes and have wild sex parties which were recorded. King was subsequently harassed incessantly, and in 1964 he received an anonymous blackmail letter stating that, there is only one thing left for you to do, which King interpreted as an exhortation for him to commit suicide. But others were targeted as well, such as Malcolm X, the Nation of Islam, John Lennon, Muhammad Ali, and members of the Black Panthers, just to name a few. In 1965, white civil rights worker Viola Liuzzo was murdered when Ku Klux Klansmen chased her car after noticing that her passenger was a young black man See our video on the Ku Klux Klan. They fired shots into her car, and Klansman Gary Thomas Rowe was a known FBI informant. The FBI then spread rumors that Liozo was a member of the Communist Party and had abandoned her children to have sexual relationships with African Americans involved in the civil rights movement. FBI records do show that Hoover personally handed the accusations to President Lyndon B. Johnson, who had a public image of supporting civil rights. Again, see our video on Johnson as well. COINTELPRO finally came to an abrupt end in 1971 after its illegal operations came to light following a burglary at the FBI office in Medea, Pennsylvania. The condemnation was furious, and the U.S. Senate Church Committee, led by Senator Frank Church, Democrat from Idaho, investigated the FBI in 1975. It was formally known as the United States Senate Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities. The committee clearly established that COINTELPRO's activities were illegal and violated the Constitution. In essence, Hoover broke the law. Regarding J. Edgar Hoover's collection of audio tapes and illegal surveillance, biographer Kenneth Ackerman wrote that the allegation that Hoover's secret files kept presidents from firing him is a myth. However, Richard Nixon was recorded in 1971 as stating that one of the reasons he would not fire Hoover was that he was afraid of Hoover's reprisals against him. Apparently, Hoover kept files on everyone. Hoover was an American version of Reinhard Heydrich, who kept files on everyone in the Third Reich, including his bosses, Heinrich Himmler and Adolf Hitler. 
This would explain why Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson never fired him. The Kennedy files were known to be explosive regarding JFK's numerous affairs, along with his brother Robert. But here is something of great interest. The FBI led the investigation into the assassination of John F. Kennedy and in 1964, just days before Hoover testified before the Warren Commission, President Johnson waived the then-mandatory U.S. government service retirement age of 70. This allowed Hoover to remain as the FBI director for an indefinite period of time. Many critics consider this to be a quid pro quo, as Hoover and the FBI were criticized for not doing a proper investigation. Later in life and after his death, Hoover became a controversial figure as evidence of his secretive abuses of power began to surface. He was also found to have routinely violated both the FBI's own policies and the very laws which the FBI was charged with enforcing, and to have collected evidence using illegal surveillance, wiretapping, and burglaries. However, Hoover consequently amassed a great deal of power and was able to intimidate and threaten political figures, including high-ranking ones. In essence, he had created and ruled over his own medieval fiefdom for decades with little to no oversight. Hoover left a legacy that is still felt today. Because Hoover's actions came to be seen as abuses of power, FBI directors are now limited to one 10-year term subject to extension by the United States Senate. As we have seen with the current Department of Justice and the FBI, as well as other federal agencies, corruption is always part of the plan depending upon who is in office. Hoover was the last grand master to wield unlimited power regardless of who was president. J. Edgar Hoover died of a heart attack on May 2, 1972, and his role was assumed by Associate Director Clyde Tolson, his alleged lover. But on May 3, 1972, Nixon appointed Al Patrick Gray of the Justice Department, with no experience in the FBI, as acting director, with W. Mark Felt becoming Associate Director. Nixon was cleaning house. Apparently, the legacy of J. Edgar Hoover was over. Thanks for watching today's episode of Forgotten History. If you like this episode, please consider becoming a channel member or joining our Patreon page. This would help us offset the ever-increasing cost of production. As always, please like, share, and comment. And if you have any show ideas, please contact us, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.